Are we ready to roll? Yes, thanks, Ian. Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to this um, AIOH or Australian Institute of Occupational Hygiene this webinar um, on practical guide to welding fume and control. Um, but before we go any further, I'd also like to do an acknowledgement to country. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists um, acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So moving on then to the um, webinar today, it is a presentation which is going to examine the dangers of welding fumes and the different product control methods, the advantages and disadvantages of each, and then more importantly, how they can be used in combination to reduce welding fume exposure to as low as reasonably practicable. Now, it's actually rather serendipitous um, that this, this um, webinar has come to be, uh, because I've actually just set off what I hope is the final version of the AOH uh, position paper on welding fume um, and cutting fume um, health effects. So look out for that coming in the future. Our presenters today are David Chippendale and Dan Kelly, um, both from Australian Welding Services or AWS as it's called. David is Director of Marketing and Sales and has worked in the welding safety industry for over 15 years and has authored numerous welding fume safety white papers, welding industry reports and practical welding fume control framework. He is a member of the Welding Safety Council made up of industry and legislative safety authorities and heads up the technical team of AWS. Dan Kelly is the technical specialist, Victoria and Tasmania. Um, he is a boilermaker by trade and has worked both as a welder and as a technical welding sales specialist over a 20 year career. Dan is a welding product manager at AWS, specializing in welding fume product controls. And without further ado, I introduce you to both David and Dan for a, I hope it was a great presentation. Thank you very much, Ian. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> All right, yep. so as Ian mentioned, thanks for the introduction, Ian, and thank you, Michelle, for organizing it. Um, as Ian mentioned, we're gonna be speaking today about a practical guide to welding fume control. Uh, my name is David Chippendale, and with me is Dan Kelly, and we both work for a company called AWS, or Australian Welding Supplies. If you haven't heard of us um, and you work within the welding industry, you probably know us more from our products and brands. So we look after the 3M Speedglass brand of auto darkening welding helmets with integrated respiratory protection. We've just launched some exciting new technology, um, Translas on gun fume extraction. We look after the range of Nediman portable local exhaust ventilation systems. And we also wholesale the complete range of 3M personal safety products, um, including disposable and reusable half mask respirators that can be worn underneath a non-respiratory welding helmet. So as a business, um, we are extremely well placed to speak about the different types of product controls that can be introduced into a workplace to better control welding fume and to protect workers and welders from that welding fume. And that is essentially what we're gonna be talking about today. So we're going to be talking about the different types of product controls, um, how they're different from one another, so the advantages and disadvantages of each. But most importantly, we're going to talk about how they can be used in combination to bring welding fume exposure down to as low as reasonably practical, which of course should always be our end goal. Now, I know you're probably all across um, welding fume, so I won't spend too much time here, but you're probably all aware that in 2017, the IARC, so the International Agency for the Research on Cancer, reclassified welding fume as carcinogenic. Um, two years later, 2019, a meta-analysis was released and the researchers in that study concluded that 
Welders run a 43% increased risk of lung cancer um, when compared with those who've never welded or been exposed to welding fume. Of course, aside from cancer, there are also a myriad of other health effects, um, including bronchial asthma, COPD, pneumoconiosis and other pulmonary fibrosis, um, stomach ulcers, kidney damage, nervous system damage, and unfortunately that list does have a tendency to go on and on. Um, but we try not to dwell too much on that. Um, what we like to talk about is the fact that protecting welders can be straightforward. But to protect our welders, um, of course, action is required. And what action do we take? Well, obviously, if we're following the letter of the law, which we always must do, um, we follow the hierarchy of control. Now, don't worry, I know all of you know everything about the hierarchy of control. Um, but before I leave uh, this slide, I'd just like to make a key point, which is the hierarchy of control is a general framework that's used across a whole range of industries. It wasn't built specifically for the welding industry and nor was it built specifically to tackle welding fume. So what we see in the welding industry, unlike many other industries, is that the highest levels of control, um, elimination and substitution, really can only combine to mitigate the risks when it comes to dealing with welding fume. They can't remove it completely. So that's why we have to delve deeper into the hierarchy of control. They're still extremely important, you know, removing surface coatings and anything else that you can do on that elimination and substitution level. But regardless, you are going to have to move further down that hierarchy of control. So the key point there is the lower levels of control will be essential. Um, if welding is to be done, then welding fume will be present even after you've carried out elimination and substitution controls. And if you really want to protect the welder um, and bring welding fume exposure down to as low as reasonably practicable, then at some stage, you're going to need to introduce product controls. Um, so what's in our arsenal for product controls? Well, product controls fall under two main categories. We have our LEV, so local exhaust ventilation, which of course falls under engineering controls. And we have our PPE, so personal protective equipment. Under the banner of LEV, we have our fixed installations, uh, which are built into the infrastructure of the workshop. We have our portable units that are mobile units that can be wheeled around the workplace or some of them you can even carry and um, used where required. And then we have our on-gun fume extraction, which is actually built into the actual welding gun. So the definition of capturing at source. Then under the banner of PPE, the ones that we primarily see in the welding industry being used, uh, welding helmets uh, with integrated respiratory protection. And there are two main, two main types. You have your PAPR, powered air purifying respirators, and then you have your supplied air. So 99% of the time, 98% of the time, you're gonna be dealing with PAPR. Um, PAPR is a unit that you wear on your back. We'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it sucks air in from the welder's environment and runs it through a series of filters and delivers clean air up into the welder's head top. Supplied air brings air in from an external area, so via a compressor, through a filtration system and then delivers that up into the welder's head top. So the key point there to remember is that PAPR brings, fume, uh, brings air in from around the welder and supplied air brings air in from an external source, which will come into play a little bit later. And then we have our P2 half mass respirators. So I think everybody now knows what a, what a half mass respirator is after uh, the last two years with COVID. Um, and then you also have your reusable respirators where instead of throwing all of it out, like a disposable respirator, you replace the filters on the side. So that is our arsenal against uh, welding fume from a product control standpoint. So now let's dig a little bit deeper into LEV. So the key difference, as I'm sure most of you know, between LEV and PPE is that local exhaust ventilation, it removes welding fume from the environment. So it stops the spread of welding fume. It protects, it can protect the welder, um, but it also removes welding fume from the environment, protecting everyone else in close proximity to the welder. PPE, on the other hand, is a great control to protect the welder, but it can't protect anyone in close proximity to the welder unless, of course, they're wearing it as well. So that's the key difference, and most likely why uh, LEV exists higher up the hierarchy of control as an engineering control. So now to dig deeper into each type of LEV uh, product control. So we have our fixed installations. The key advantage of fixed installations is that they can deal with really heavy welding fume environments. Typically what they're doing is they're moving welding fume from point A to point B. Um, point A being inside the workshop and point B being outside the workshop. 
And normally they, they can, but normally they don't have a filtration system. So even in really heavy fume environments, it's not clogging up your filters. The filters aren't becoming loaded, which means that heavy, heavy welding fume environments aren't a problem for fixed installations. Some of the disadvantages of fixed installations is that as the name would imply, they are fixed, um, meaning they don't follow the welder as the welder moves. And if you are a welder or if you work with welders and you watch them, you'll see that they're around things, over things, under things, they're moving, okay? So it's, it is a serious limitation to consider. And positioning is critical when it comes to fixed installations. So depending on flow and depending on the manufacturer, as a rule of thumb, you probably wanna be around 30 centimeters away from the extraction point. If you move too far away from the extraction point, then these systems are ineffective. If you move too close to these systems, then they'll suck up the shielding gas, which can lead to quality issues. So if you're too far away, it's a problem. And if you're too close, it's a problem. That being said, these systems can be a great solution for heavy fume environments where the welder will remain in the correct position relevant to the capture pool, okay? Portable LEV, when compared to fixed installations, um, they can be a more economical option. So what I mean there is with portable LEV, you're probably coming into the market, you know, for your more basic systems at around three grand. Whereas fixed installations, you know, uh, once all installed, um, you wouldn't be coming into the market south of 10 grand. So up front, they can be a more economical option. And in many ways, they can offer more flexibility. And what I mean by that is because they're mobile, you can move them around the workshop. If you have welders in different areas who need extraction at different times, then you can wheel it around. Or in the future, if your situation is going to change and you need to move the portal LEV around, again, that it adds that layer of flexibility. Disadvantages of portable LEV, we run into some of the same pro problems as fixed installations. So again, even though they're, mo they're mobile, once they're positioned, they do not follow the welder as the welder moves. And just like fixed installations, positioning is critical. So too far away, problem, too close, problem. You need to stay static in the same position. The other main issue that we see in the market with portable LEV is that it's horses for courses. And a lot of companies they believe that it's kind of one size fits all when it comes to portable LEV. They buy a unit and then they don't understand why it doesn't work for them. Um, it's key with portable LEV that you need to match these systems up with the specific application. Um, ideally, you're looking at how much welding fume is being produced. Um, and it all comes down to the filter configuration. So you'll have disposable filters, which are okay for light fume environments. You'll have cleanable filters, so the user actually cleans these filters, which are okay for medium type welding fume environments. And then you can even get self-cleaning portable LEV, which is okay for heavy fume environments. Um, but there are different filters too. You know, surface area comes into play, um, whether you're welding with low alloy or high alloy, they're all considerations that need to be taken into account. Um, hence why I say, you know, it's horses for courses. We need to match that system with your specific application which takes me to on-gun fume extraction. So in my opinion, uh, on-gun fume extraction on paper is one of the most practical uh, welding fume control solutions going around. And the reason why I say that is because it does what no other product control solution can do. It removes welding fume from the environment, just like fixed installations and portable LEV. But unlike fixed installations and portable LEV, it follows the welder as the welder moves. You know, it's built into the gun. So wherever the gun goes, so too the extraction follows. It can also, depending on what system you have, um, our system has high capture rates up to 98%. So not only is it really practical, it's a very, very effective control as well. Now you may have caught me say on paper. And, uh, the reason why I said on paper is because in a survey we recently conducted with over 1500 welders in, across Australia and New Zealand, um, we found that only 1% of the market currently use on-gun fume extraction in Australia and New Zealand. And why? It's because in the past, it's been too heavy, it's been too big, it's cumbersome, it's difficult to position, welders don't like it, and safety professionals don't like it because um, if the extraction is doing enough to remove the welding fume, it affects the shielding gas. And if extraction isn't up enough, then it's not removing the welding fume. So you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. It's, it, it wasn't, I guess, delivering on its promise. Um, technological advancements now have meant that the systems that we've, we've just launched 
now are the same size and same weight as non-extraction welding guns. And because of the cyclonic nature of how the extraction works, all the extraction takes place on the outside, leaving the shielding gas on the inside completely unaffected um, whilst delivering that high capture rate up to 98%. So it's pretty exciting that we've launched that. And I think 1% you know, of the market use it today. We're, we're hoping that you know, that becomes a category that more and more people are exploring and looking into. One limitation of on-gun fume extraction is that it can do TIG welding, it can do MIG welding, it can do flux core. Um, what it can't do is stick welding at this stage. It can't do stick welding. And based on a survey we conducted, again, same survey, uh, still 20% of welders are doing stick welding. So, you know, we, this will cater to up to 80% of the market, but it won't be able to cater to those stick welders. Now, the majority of people on here are probably occupational hygienists or working within the welding industry. Um, so you've probably come across fixed installations multiple times. You would have come across portable LEV a lot as well. But considering that on-gun fume extraction is only used by 1% of the market, I thought I might just dig a little bit deeper on that control in the next slide. So I'm just going to play two videos. The first is just showing um, on-gun fume extraction turned off to show you how much fume is being produced by that application. And then they'll turn that on-gun fume extraction on and you'll see the effect that it has on that welding fume. And the second is a case study out of North America who introduced this on-gun fume extraction, so translast on-gun fume extraction. And there were some benefits that they were expecting and then some benefits that they weren't expecting. So I'll just play those videos. Hopefully they work for you. So here you'll see the vacuum is off and you can see how much welding fume is being produced. And that's spreading. That's gonna affect everybody else around the welder as well. Now the vacuum's on. And you can see it twisting that welding fume and removing it from the environment. Which means it's protecting the use and also protecting everybody around the welder as well. I also think it's one of the best nods at the end of that video ever as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I'll just play the case study. Carabini was started in 1967, purchased by the current owners, Renato and Danilo Gasparetto, in 72. And they've taken it from primarily an ornamental railing shop to what we see today, which is a multi-million dollar state-of-the-art fabrication facility. We're starting a project, uh, it's going to be for downtown Toronto in an area called Portland. We're going to be fabricating four bridges for that location. We have an environmental approach to everything that we do. A lot of our products are 90% recyclable. One of the things that Cherubini is being very progressive with going forward is we are trying to reduce the manganese levels that we have uh, in the shop as well, which has actually helped forge our relationship with Translas. Air quality systems that capture the dust and fume once it's been let out into a huge facility like this 
um, are largely ineffective unless you have massive systems to deal with changing the air volume and filtering it. Looking at source capture for these things is, is the ultimate solution, we believe. One of the things that we knew that we needed to do was we needed better protection in the shop for the employees and other people that are walking throughout the shop as well. Um, one thing that Translast has afforded us with their uh, source capture is now we're actually removing the welding fume right at that point of contact. I mean, if you can capture something before it escapes into the atmosphere, into your shop, then you don't have to worry about trying to trap it later. Stopping the problem before it becomes a problem, that's key. It's protecting the employee doing the welding and it's also protecting the other employees walking throughout the shop at the same time. We have uh, multiple fabrication facilities, so it's very important to us that we actually have the ability to move the welder throughout the unit. We're doing a lot of confined space work right now, so the units are going from bay to bay to bay, and the welder, we haven't introduced any more weight to the system that we're using, so it's quite flexible. It's actually probably even more flexible than what we had before. One thing that we discovered with the equipment after we've been using it for a few weeks, it was actually helping to uh, correct some of the bad habits and, and welding techniques that our operators had, our welding operators. Um, the gun, the nice thing about the gun, it's engineered to design to operate within a certain uh, range of parameters, whether it be your drag angle, your work angle, your lead drag angle. So the gun is correcting those bad habits for us, and that was just an added benefit that we picked up without even knowing it was going to be there. Investing in the training to get these guns working the way that they're designed to be designed to be used will make this will make them ultimately successful in capturing that smoke before it gets out into the atmosphere. And that's that's the whole goal of buying these guns. We believe this is the future and I think we'll see other other fabricators get on board with this and we would recommend that that anybody in this in this business uh, look into this source capture welding guns. All right. I'll now. Uh, so I've I've covered off LEV. Um, I'll now hand you across to Dan Kelly, and he'll take you through product controls from a PPE standpoint. Thanks, Dave. Um, Look, obviously with PPE, there's there's multiple forms of PPE that can be worn um, for the user and to, to protect themselves from exposure to welding fume. Um, I'll cover over uh, obviously the obvious ones being, you know, half face respirators or which which will also uncover um, the reusable side as well. And then we'll we'll go against the the PAPR side as well. So starting with disposable and reusable masks. Um, they can give a protection factor of 10 um, for the user, which most of you guys are probably well and truly across. Um, fit testing is required. Um, you must be clean shaven um, for an effective seal also. There's a real, in my experience, um, from a practical side, being out in the marketplace and, and speaking to a lot of end users, uh, there's a real lack of understanding um, about this. And it's really common to see uh, incorrect fit in workshops because they're not educated enough and and haven't probably um, chased up the relevant information to make sure that they're doing the right thing. They just get that they think they're doing the right thing by putting a P2 mask or a half face reusable on a user and they probably well, they don't understand the, the requirements around fit testing and, and, and shaving and cleaning your face up to make sure that fit and seal is, is suitable. The other part that, that factors into to half face respirators is that they can be uncomfortable to wear in certain welding conditions and obviously um, hot environments as well. So in the summer, you know, that you've got a, a, some, you know, a half face respirator on your face, it can you know, lead to sweating and it's just, they, they can be reasonably uncomfortable. Um, the other factor that comes into that is the breathing resistance uh, for the user as well. So that, that's an important one, especially when you've got added layers of filtration um, for certain applications, you've got extra layers that you need to breathe through under your own steam, essentially. Um, some of these, these um, half face respirators uh, don't fit under certain welding helmets. Um, obviously, Speed Glass and 3M uh, being the same business or part of the same business, um, they work fine, but it can be an issue in other circumstances for other, for other 
helmets. The perceived upfront cost saving um, can also be a little bit misleading in the long term in long term use. Um, you know, having a, a half face respirator at, at ten to fifteen dollars, you know, over a, a certain period of time, over years potentially, um, can add up. So the upfront cost of a of a PAPR essentially could is a little bit more, but over time, um, which I'll, I'll touch on why it's probably a little bit more effective in other reasons, but in other aspects, but over time it can be more effective, cost effective. The other part too, which leads into that question, uh, it leads into that that statement. Sorry, is more about the filters. Um, and disposable masks with those those disposables also load quickly due to the proximity to the welding plume. Obviously, a welder's got it right on his face. Depending on how he welds, he can be reasonably close, but he's still in a closer proximity to that welding plume. Um, so jumping across to the PAPR side as well. So PAPR gives a protection factor of 50 for the user. Um, there's no fit testing um, required and it operates under positive pressure. There's no breathing resistance for the user um, and it circulates air around the user's face, which increase, increases comfort for the user as well, especially in those hotter environments. Um, the PAPR draws air from behind the welder, which I was touching on before, and that leads to less, you know, to less frequent filter changes because rather than having a, a half face in, in your welding plume, it's on your back and away from that welding plume. So it draws air from behind you. So in the long term, PAPR can be more economical um, than disposable or reusable. You jump across, Chip. So around some of the product controls, um, respiratory welding helmets offer five levels of protection to the user. Um, their eye, eye protection, face, lungs, head, uh, which is a hard hat. There are, there are certain helmets that have hard hat protection or bump cap um, that, can, that can cover that. Um, and ears as well. The system follows the welder, which is an advantage over LEV, um, and they won't, uh, as LEV, you know, won't move with the welder, which can cause fume exposure as well. Um, there's added gas and odor filters, um, depending on the user's requirements um, that can be added in. So there's a, a certain application where there's an organic or inorganic vapor being produced. There's filters that can cover that. Um, and under a survey that we did, uh, in 2020, um, it was the most widely used PPE control in Australia and New Zealand. And that was under, there was two and a half thousand welders that participated in that, which represents around 3% of the welders in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so we'll jump into admin controls. Oh, that's, uh, sorry, after this one, we've got a few videos here that go through um, some of the key facets around uh, PAPR as well. So the welding helmet, the ad flow, and obviously the welding lens. Um, which touches on those five levels of protection. Your Speedglass welding helmet with AdFlow PAPR is compliant with Australian and New Zealand standards for eye protection, high impact face protection and respiratory protection. Your flip up respiratory welding helmet features a large curved and clear visor perfect for grinding applications and low light conditions. However, the flip up functionality is also an important safety feature when it comes to your respiratory, face and eye protection. With a standard a non-flip up welding helmet, if you lift the helmet for clearer views to inspect your workpiece or move around the workplace, you break your positive pressure respiratory seal. By lifting the welding helmet, you not only allow for particles still suspended in the air to enter your breathing zone, you also remove your eye and face protection, putting yourself in danger from hazards created by those around you. This could include radiation or fast moving high velocity hazards. With integrated flip up welding helmets with powered air respiratory protection, welders can have completely clear and uninhibited views of their workpiece and surroundings while maintaining their head, eye and respiratory protection at all times. For extended non-welding work, simply unscrew the two dials on the side of the helmet to completely remove the welding visor. 
and then reattach the dials again before starting work. Removing the welding visor reduces the weight of the helmet by 35%. A helmet mounted task light is also available as an optional extra to provide hours of powerful lighting and is powered by the AdFlow battery pack. Designed specifically for welding, the task light enables welders to enter and work in poorly lit spaces. The light was designed to cast a wide light on the workpiece with even light distribution at normal welding distance with configurable light intensity. Built for heavy duty welding environments, the G501 provides a number of configurable coverage options so you can customise your helmet to your individual needs and preferences. Options include large head covers, neck covers and shrouds made with high-vis, leather and heat and splatter resistant fabric. For more control over your comfort, the air duct system lets you direct the airflow to either your face, your visor or a combination of both. You can even adjust the amount of air coming from the top outlet or the two side outlets or choose a combination of both. All airflow adjustments can be made while you're wearing the helmet, maintaining your eye, face and respiratory protection. An innovative quick release attachment enables one-handed breathing tube connection and release. The face seal is to be fitted under your chin and tightened using the pull tabs to create a comfortable positive pressure seal. Your speed glass head harness was designed to give you a customised fit through multiple adjustment options. The first sizing adjustment you can make relates to the two adjustable straps across the crown of your head. These two crown straps should be adjusted so that they are both fitted snugly across the top of your head. The smooth ratchet mechanism at the back of the harness articulates to provide a better fit and can be incrementally tightened until you find the perfect fit. If you wear a cap when welding, you can also remove and flip the ratchet mechanism to provide a better fit. A large back pad is also provided with every system to provide enhanced comfort. You can adjust the distance between your face and the helmet using the distance adjustment settings on the side of the harness. Simply push in the grey button on the harness on each side to move your face either closer or further away from the welding lens. The front of the harness adjusts to your forehead for maximum comfort and the overall head harness design avoids sensitive areas and pressure points on your head. Angle adjustment can also be configured using the angle adjuster on the right side of the harness. Using the angle adjustment, you can manoeuvre the helmet to rest against your chest or angle it into a position more conducive to overhead welding. Lastly, the two tightening mechanisms on the sides of the helmet have two independent functions. The right side is used to adjust the friction of lifting and lowering the welding helmet and the left side determines how tight you want your helmet held in the park position when it's raised. Understanding the adjustments and the customizations available to you will ensure you benefit from the best possible comfort and fit. Now this is on the um, AdFlow PAPR, so powered air purifying respirator. Takes you into detail. The AdFlow powered air purifying respirator is compliant with the Australian and New Zealand standard for respiratory protection and has a required minimum protection factor or RMPF of 50. An RMPF of 50 means that your PAPR will supply you with breathing air at least 50 times cleaner of particulates than the air you would breathe if you were unprotected. The internal configuration comprises of a number of layers. A spark arrester to protect the system from sparks and hot splatter a pre-filter to prolong the life of the main particle filter, and a particle filter that performs to P3 level with a capture efficiency of greater than 99.95% against the challenge aerosol used by the Australian and New Zealand standard, AS-NZS-1716. The spark arrestor pre-filter and particle filter must always be used to provide the desired level of protection. When we turn the system on, it delivers a constant flow of air at a rate of 170 litres per minute. One green indicator will be illuminated. If we press the on button for a second time, the flow rate increases to 200 litres per minute. Two green lights will be illuminated. To return to 170 litres per minute, we simply press the on button for a third time. 
As an example, the higher flow rate can be used to improve wearer comfort in extra hot and humid conditions. To turn the system off, hold the off button down for at least one second. The Adflow PAPR is delivered with either a standard battery that provides approximately eight hours runtime with a fully charged battery and clean filters, or a heavy duty battery option that provides approximately 12 hours runtime with fully charged battery and clean filters. The Adflow has a three bar battery indicator showing remaining capacity. When the last bar starts flashing and an audible warning alarm is heard, less than 5% battery capacity is remaining. The battery charger is provided with the PAPR system and can be plugged into the battery while the battery is still attached to the PAPR unit. Or you can remove the battery from the PAPR and charge it separately. The battery will be fully charged in approximately four to five hours, depending on residual capacity. Alternatively, with the rapid charge feature, you can charge the battery to 80% capacity in approximately one hour. When the charger is fully charged, the light on the charger will display a constant green light. After using your AdFlow system, it is important to charge your battery. This will not only ensure that you are ready to weld again tomorrow, but also helps prolong the life of the battery itself. When stored, recharge the battery every six months. The AdFlow air filter unit has a particle filter indicator made up of three green lights and two red lights. As soon as the particle filter indicator reaches the first red light, it is time to change your particle filter. You should change your pre-filter regularly to extend the life of the particle filter. Changing your filters regularly will lighten the workload of the motor and prolong the AdFlow battery life, so you can weld for longer. If you notice your battery runtime has become too short, you should check your filters. Lastly, before each shift, you should visually inspect the filters to ensure there has been no breakthrough, such as a tear in the particle filter. If this occurs, it will mean that the particles can enter the motor, potentially damaging your PAPR and allowing welding fume particles to enter your lungs. If upon your inspection, you discover visible damage, replace the filter immediately. Do not attempt to remove particles from the filters using compressed air or a vacuum cleaner, as this will likely damage the filters, and as a result, the AdFlow PAPR will not deliver the expected level of protection. It will also void your warranty. If at any time you hear the low flow alarm, you must stop work immediately and remove yourself from where the welding fume is present. If your filters are clean and the low flow alarm sounds, contact AWS immediately. For applications that emit a foul odour like welding galvanised steel, there is an optional odour filter that can be positioned between the particle filter and the AdFlow motor body. Optional gas filters are also available to provide a level of protection against different gases if required. Replace the odour filter when you begin to smell unpleasant odours. Gas filters should be changed in accordance with your workplace filter change schedule. The AdFlow PAPR has a two-year revolving warranty, meaning that if you experience an issue with your PAPR within this period, you'll be issued with a replacement and your period of cover starts again. You can extend your cover to three years for free by registering your product on the AWS website at awsi.com.au. Okay, and then the final component is the welding lens. So we've looked at the welding helmet, the ad flow system, and now the welding lens. The auto darkening welding lens switches itself on as soon as you pick up your welding helmet and features a shade three light state with speed glass true view. If we compare the light transmittance levels of speed glass true view optics versus other welding lenses, we see that the speed glass true view lens allows a wider spectrum of colors to pass through the welding lens. By allowing more red and blue and less of the strong green you see in other welding lenses, the optics are far more natural and balanced. A wider spectrum of visible light means more contrast, superior vision and better welds. To provide better vision and more control of your weld puddle, the G501 welding lens also features speed glass variable colour technology. 
This allows you to choose between A, natural, B, cool, or C, warm color tones for your dark state. You determine which color provides the best viewing contrast for your welds and most comfort for your eyes. The G501 gives you true view in the light state and variable color in the dark state. The outside of the welding lens has a purple colored layer. This layer, or more accurately, combination of layers, is a UV IR filter. This filter blocks harmful ultraviolet and infrared radiation. Regardless, if the welding lens is on or off, in the light state or the dark state, you are always protected from welder's flash while looking through the welding lens. This protection, this protection is constant and equal to a conventional shade 14 passive welding lens. The only light that passes through the UV IR filter is visible light. Obviously, the visible light that is emitted from a welding arc is extremely bright. We soften this visible light through our variable dark shade options. The dark shade options available to you with the G501 welding lens are shade 5 for your cutting applications, shade 8 for your lower amperage work, like low amp TIG, and shades 9 through to 14 as you begin to ramp up the amps. As an example, you could use shade 9 for welding on around 100 amps, and shade 14 as you move over 350 to 400 amps. The basic idea here is that the more amps you're using, the brighter the light from the arc, and consequently, the darker the shade you will require to soften the visible light. Pressing down on both the minus and plus shade buttons allows you to lock your lens into any dark shade so that it behaves like a passive welding lens. As an example, you may want to lock the lens into shade five for cutting applications. Simply press both the plus and minus buttons simultaneously again to unlock the lens. The photo sensors on the outside of your welding lens are what detect the radiation from the welding arc and cause the welding lens to auto darken from its light state, shade three, to your preset dark shade in response. This all happens within 0.1 of a millisecond. The sensors on your speed glass welding lens are the most powerful on the market able to detect an arc down to one amp. However, you can determine how sensitive you want the sensors to be. For example, if you are using a new high-end inverter-based TIG machine, which offers an incredibly stable arc, or you are TIG welding using very low amps, you will want your sensitivity as powerful as possible. If you are working in close proximity to another welder, you may want to reduce your sensitivity so that your lens does not darken in response to the light emitted from their arc. The sensitivity settings range from setting one to five, with one being the lowest sensitivity and five being the highest sensitivity. As a rule of thumb, we would recommend using setting one to stop your lens reacting to external light sources like other welders, two for stick and MIG, three for TIG, four for low amp TIG, and five for any applications where there is a risk of hidden arc. That is, anywhere you'd lose direct sight of the arc. The last piece of the puzzle when it comes to the functionality of the welding lens is the delay setting. Once you finish welding, the lens automatically returns to the light state, shade three, allowing for immediate and safe inspection of the weld pool and preparation for the next weld. However, with the delay setting, you will have the ability to shorten or extend this delay. As an example, if you are welding stainless steel on high amps, even after you have finished welding, the molten pool will still be extremely bright. In this case, you will want to extend the time it takes the lens to switch back to the light state, or in other words, increase your delay. Conversely, if you are tack welding, after you have finished a weld, you'll want the lens to return to the light state as fast as possible, so you can move on to your next weld position. In this situation, you would select to decrease your delay. Once you have customized your speed glass auto darkening lens to your specific application, using the shade, sensitivity, delay and variable color settings, you're ready to start welding. As an option, you can also pair your G501 welding lens with your mobile phone via Bluetooth using the 3M connected equipment app. Once you have paired the lens to your device, you can control all your welding lens settings directly from your mobile, including programming up to four memory modes. Settings for dark shades, sensitivity, delay, and variable color. As an example, you could program the shade, sensitivity, delay and color tone settings for low amp TIG applications and the same for high amperage MIG welding. Then, instead of needing to change all the settings on the lens when switching from MIG to TIG, you could quickly select your TIG memory mode on the device and get back to welding. The app also allows you to record maintenance and review statistics on how you use your welding lens. A magnifying lens holder on the welding lens allows for precise mag lens placement. 
The magnifying lenses come in 100, 150, 200, 250 and 300 percent magnification. Your welding lens is compliant with Australian and New Zealand standards and is backed by a three-year revolving warranty, meaning that if you experience an issue with your lens within this period, you'll be issued with a replacement and your period of cover starts again. You can extend your cover to four years for free by registering your product on the AWS website at awsi.com.au. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the last video. Sorry if it was a, it took a, it took a while, but it's very hard to demonstrate products on a webinar, so better to show videos. Thanks, Chiba. So to, to, go, to keep in, that, in line with what we've just seen, obviously we've seen a fair bit of information around the PAPR. Um, it's probably a good point to show some of the administrative controls because um, they're a key factor in after-sales service and sometimes they are forgotten about um, in certain aspects and, and businesses really, really need to make sure that this box is ticked to support the products and make sure that they're doing the right things with the users. So training is a must do and vital for correct usage and maximum effectiveness for the user. Um, product ma uh, maintenance is also a vital part of the control process and setting up a regular maintenance schedule um, is very important for keeping it, the PAPR um, at its best for effective protection levels. Um, a business should also consider the welding area and where possible control access and dedicate areas to welding to minimise fume exposure to non-welding staff. Um, and the last one, which is a tricky one, obviously confined space. Um, confined space is sometimes unavoidable. Um, it, it, it is to be minimised where possible due to the complex requirements, um, which most of you guys will be across, you know, suitably trained personnel um, and air monitors, et cetera. There's a, a long list there, but um, avoiding confined space welding um, where possible. Is, is, a, is a good control, administrative control. All right, so now I'm gonna take you through a um, practical guide to product control selection. Um, and the key goal here is to reduce welding fume exposure down to as low as reasonably practicable. And we're attacking this whilst considering practicality, comfort, cost, and protection. So the way we do it within our business um, from a recommendation standpoint is the first question we ask, are you working in an environment that already has engineering controls in place, like extraction, or is it a really well ventilated area? If it's a very well ventilated area or engineering controls are already in place, then we'd recommend a welding helmet with a PAPR for most common materials and applications. Um, you know, it offers that integrated eye protection, ultraviolet and infrared radiation, it offers you high impact face protection, um, which is an absolute necessity if you're gonna be grinding. And it offers you that respiratory protection as well. So from a practicality standpoint, it follows you around the workshop. It cools you down from a comfort side. It is an extremely cost effective solution compared to the other product controls. And from a protection standpoint, it's really hard to look past. Um, you know, we've had these in worst case scenarios um, under, under um, examination burning off 1.6 flux core. It's been over 30 milligrams per cubic meter outside of the welding helmet. And inside the welding helmet, it was flatlining at 0.00. So a, a really effective and practical product control. If, you were, if you're welding in an environment that doesn't already have an engineering controls in place um, and is not well ventilated, and it is not defined as a confined space as per Safe Work Australia's code of practice, then we recommend a combination of controls. So if the welder can remain relatively static and in a correct position relevant to the capture hood, then we would likely recommend a PAPR in combination with either portable or fixed LEV. Um, we learnt about the differences between those two before. So portable LEV of, um, offers more flexibility and can be more cost effective up front. And then your fixed LEV is probably a better solution for really heavy welding fume environments. That said though, um, you can get portable LEV, which is suitable for heavy welding fume environments as well, um, as long as it has that self-cleaning functionality. Um, if the welder requires mobility, um, then we would recommend a combination of a PAPR uh, with on-gun fume extraction. So as we learned before, on-gun fume extraction follows the welder as they move. Um, now, in this situation, 
you can see an asterisk uh, on static bench welding and an asterisk on mobility required. If you're in that situation, but you can't, uh, due to a restriction of space, you can't implement LEV. So for example, you can't fit portable LEV or you can't get the extraction hood to reach the welder. Um, or if you need mobility um, and you're stick welding, then we recommend supplied air respiratory protection. Um, we learned before it's for specialized circumstances. And the difference between it and PAPR is that it brings air in from an external source. So it brings it in from a compressor, which makes it suitable for a situation or an environment like that. If you're working in a space that is enclosed or partially in enclosed, then in the welding industry, it, it's very likely that that's gonna be a confined space. And the reason for that is that, you know, welding fume can build up very quickly and make it a very dangerous situation. So as DK touched on, um, if you are working in an enclosed or partially enclosed space within the welding industry and you're a welder, then it must be assessed on the spot by a suitably trained person um, confined spaces are a multifactorial issue with welding fume being just one of the things that needs to be taken into account. There are obviously product controls, um, but all of them will have their limitations within a confined space. So it's important that you need to talk to a suitably trained person and someone who understands the advantages and disadvantages of each product control in that type of situation. Obviously the recommendations we've made there are based on, um, we assume that elimination and substitution controls have taken place. Procedural controls, as DK mentioned, have been wrapped around everything else. And of course, consulting with yourselves, occupational hygienists and safety specialists to ensure that all the other variables are taken into account as well. DK? Well, it drops into who is responsible, I suppose now, and, and the look, ultimately the employer has the primary responsibility for PPE. Um, that, that's, you know, it's often not the case due to probably a lack of understanding in the marketplace. Um, again, touching on the survey that we conducted um, in 20, uh, 2020, 11% of welders said that fume monitoring had not been done at their workplace as well, which is, which is pretty low. Um, and, and obviously the financial responsibility part, which I touched on earlier, so there's a bit of there's a bit of education there for the marketplace to understand you know these factors around what's the next step um, regarding fume monitoring if they're unsure and and also touching on the financial responsibility which is cloudy in the marketplace. Touching on the exposure limits and this is no no news to you guys um, but I'll, I'll fly through this one because obviously you're pretty well across this but the current exposure levels um, do not represent a dividing line between safe and unsafe a safe and an unsafe work environment. When operating within the exposure standard of five milligrams per cubic meter, um, an unprotected welder could inhale up to 11 grams of welding fume each year. Um, and that's where it's important to introduce controls like PAPR, LEV, or on torch extraction to help reduce a user's exposure level and reduce the fume level to as low as reasonably practical as well. Couple of quick stats, um, obviously based on the, the, the survey that we conducted, 32% um, of that survey had no respiratory re protection, um, uh, no respiratory protection, sorry, I'll spit it out, or engineering controls, um, which is a little concerning. And only 20% feel protected from welding fume. Um, so that's why it's, you know, it's really important to create awareness in the marketplace. Um, I myself personally conduct uh, TAFE talks with, with apprentices. And it's something I'm a little bit passionate about. No one ever did that for me when I was at an apprentice. Um, and just getting these kids um, and young men and women into, into something, a P2 mask is something that just to start protecting themselves and so they can afford to get in to something or, or talk to their employer about you know PPE or engineering controls to protect them in the workplace. And, and lastly, from me, um, our presentation's been uh, based on our practical guide to welding fume control. It also comes with a blueprint um, to welding fume control, which is designed to help businesses navigate to the most practical solution for their needs. Um, if, if you're interested in, in this, we can, you know, Dave can email this through at the end of the presentation, or you can request a hard copy, um, but just reach out to Dave and he's more than happy to forward that on. 
And uh, there are my details as well. If anyone wants to get in touch, if you have any questions or you'd like to reach out and ask for a copy of the practical guide, or if there are any other questions that come up that we can't field now, because I don't think we've left much time, have we, Ian and Michelle? <laughs> no, not a lot. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, do we have any questions from the participants, the attendees? I think they've been answering questions from each other, by each other. I saw the chat was, yeah. was rather busy. <laughs> Um, well, if no one else has a question, I, I had a couple of questions. And one of them is um, you were talking about the PAPR system. Um, what's the battery life like on those these days? It's, it's uh, eight hours for a standard battery and 12 hours. No, no, no. I meant um, generally in the past, when I've been, my experience with these units is that the battery ends up with a, a memory and you end up with um, shorter life as it gets older. So how often do you have to change the battery? The, on the ad flow system? Any of them, really. CK, have you come across that before? Uh, look, it's it's with regards to the battery life, I suppose it's hand in hand. It's like an Apple phone. There's no different. They do tend to um, to, to lose their, uh, their their life. So they do, the percentage does decrease over time. Um, from the point of view of replacing the battery, there's, there's, no, it's, there's no real you know, firm rule to it, essentially. It's sort of case by case, to be honest, Ian, from my experience. I think, um, Ian, I, I know that Sweden has the exact details on that. Um, so instead of us shooting off the top of our heads, <laughs> I can come back to you and um, with it's the information from Sweden, if you like. So I know, okay. I know, that, I know that they've got, um, yeah, how many charge cycles. So I, I just don't know it off the top of my head. No worries, that'd be great. And uh, another one I had was, um, you mentioned the PAPR, with outside concentrations of 30 milligrams per meter cube down to 0, 0.0 milligram. How did you measure that? So we did a study down in Victoria um, with uh, GCG, uh, an occupational hygienist group. And what we wanted to do, because um, PAPRs, as you know, have a required minimum protection factor of 50, right? But overseas in some other countries, you know, there's something called an APF of a thousand. Um, and so it, you know, an APF of a thousand means that it's over a thousand times cleaner than, than um, what's outside. So we wanted to find out what the, uh, what the reduction of exposure to welding fume really was. So we asked the market um, what the four most common forms of welding were. Um, and then we ran PAPR, LEV, on-gun fume extraction and no protection against each other. Um, we have the result, we have the preliminary results of that. And yeah, we, we would like to actually do a presentation to the AIOH at another time on the results that we have. But the way it was measured was there was a real-time monitor um, inside the welding helmet and outside the welding helmet. And then there was a gravimetrical, uh, is, it, is that the right word? Gravimetrical as yep. well? Yep, yep. good. See, I did, my, I did my basic principles of occupational hygiene. Uh, <laughs> so they did the gravimetrical measurements as well outside of the welding helmet. Um, and then they correlated those two to get the, the final findings. But okay. in, inside the welding helmet for the whole period, I think there were um, uh, three, three runs of every, of every single variant that I said, and every single time within the welding helmet was flatlining at 0, 0.00, and outside the welding helmet, uh, because it was a worst case environment, the welding fume was at extremely high levels. So like I said, a really, really effective control. Mm -hmm. Great. Are there any other questions from anyone else? Uh, sorry, I got one. Um, was, uh, um, it's just about these filters, I guess they are um, particularly for um, airborne particulate. How, how about for gaseous contaminants? About sorry, I missed that one. So what contaminants? Gaseous, like gas phases, nitrogen, um, dioxide, ozone. Uh, um, the the gas? Like, yes. The gas, yeah. We, so we... Um, in that video we went over there's um you can add on gas filters as well so um you, you have those organic gas filters that can be added to the system um, which can add that level of uh, protection against gas you also have an odor filter so if you have um you know uh, as an example if you're welding with galvanized steel which can create a bad odor um that can add that nuisance level protection as well from that but yeah you, you have gas filters that can, that you can add on for protection from from gas 
Okay, thanks for that. Uh, another one, I, I was a little bit late, maybe have missed that. I, I'm particularly interested in chromium-6, which is um, uh, potentially a product from the, this welding fumes. A any idea like which welding process is going to create chromium-6, uh, most likely? Um, I mean, the people on this, uh, the people at AOH would probably know better than us, but look, it's normally chromium, you're normally going to find that in um, things like your stainless steel and your aluminium, um, when you're welding those, like a lot of the time TIG welding is conducted with stainless steel and aluminium. And a lot of people think that because there's not a lot of fume produced whilst TIG welding, um, that they're safe. But unfortunately in those materials, uh, a lot of the time that chromium can be released. So um, yeah, it can be found in aluminium and that stainless steel. Okay, all good, thanks. Do you have any other questions? I can see from Antoine, in just a, one came up, this, it is recommended that individual fumes are tested separately instead of generic welding fumes, as some fumes have a very low exposure standard. From your experience, what was the best test for all individual fumes, considering some samples require a unique filter? Sorry, say again, Ian. <laughs> Sorry to do that to you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, in the, it's in the chat line. Oh, okay. You can read okay. that, the last one Let's that came up. Um, where, where is it? In the chat. Okay. So just yeah. saying, from your experience, what was the best to test for all individual fumes, considering some samples will require a unique filter? i.e. can't test all metals and fume from one filter? Again, that's that's a question for an occupational hygienist. <laughs> um, if the position paper that we've just put out has um, got some information around that. And uh, look, there's been some study, uh, some published studies that show that from all the metals that there's only about five or six that actually regularly show up and can be done on the one filter normally. So there's a lot of things like vanadium and that, that that people tell you to go and test for, but they don't necessarily show up at all in the welding that I've seen anyway. But it, the position paper's got some more information on that. Oh. Um, so thank you, Ian, David and Dan. Um, it was a great webinar and I hope everybody enjoyed it. There will be more webinars coming up. Um, I think we've got one last question though. Have you done similar studies for other forms of welding like aluminotheric, thermic? Is that thermic no. lancing? Is that what they mean by that? If I can confirm. So the, the study that we conducted, we just asked the market what were the most common forms of welding, the most common forms of materials, and then the most common form of um, base material as well. So it, was, it ended up being your stick, your MIG, your TIG and your flux core. And so we ran that study on those four. Um, but no, we didn't do a study on that other application. Yeah, that's rail steel welding. Someone's just come up with it. Yeah, no, we haven't. Yep. Yeah, we haven't been down that path. Okay, well, we've just gone over the, the uh, one o'clock mark. And so if there are any unanswered questions or you have other questions, um, you're quite welcome to send them along to Dave. He's given you his um, email address there. Send them to him and he should be able to answer. And if there's anything on the technical side, I'm happy to answer anything as well. So thanks very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
See you later, Michelle. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Not a problem. Um, you can see if you look at the chat there, there's a lot of answers to, to yeah. some number of the questions anyway, if you wanted to send them out to everyone as well. Yeah, um, the, they've asked for the um, a copy of the presentation, so I'll get that out to everybody. We only ended up with about 111. Oh. So not too bad. Yeah. Oh, that is good. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Well, thank you so much for your time. No worries. And we'll see you around. Will do. Bye. Catch you later. Bye-bye.